Thank you, uh, Alessandro. Uh, thanks to the organisers for asking me to speak. Um, so in the, in the one minute remaining, I will, uh, <laughs> I will, be, I'll be as quick as I can. So um, if we look at the treatments that are available, um, then this slide is showing you the fracture reduction efficacy and the cost. And basically, if you look at vertebral fractures, all of these treatments are, that will reduce vertebral fracture incidence. The figures vary somewhat, but these are not head-to-head -head studies. Um, the hip fracture is seen in some treatments, but not in others. And the cost per month is probably the biggest difference between the yes, treatments. I apologize that the figures here are in pounds sterling. This is one of my slides that I'm getting ready for post-Brexit. Uh, so what you see is that HRT and the oral bisphosphonates are incredibly cheap and, and most of the alternative treatments are incredibly expensive. So if we look, therefore, saying the treatments all work, the prices are different, so the most important thing then becomes what are the risks of the treatment? And what I want to do is just concentrate on that for the rest of the talk. So we start off with HRT, looking at the major risks. Everyone talks about breast cancer. Um, with no shame, I'm going to say that as far as I'm concerned, the uh, data are inconclusive for estrogen plus progestogen, and there's no increase with estrogen alone. Stroke risk is dose-dependent and dependent on route of administration, perhaps to some extent as well. But if you start your HRT below the age of 60, there's really no stroke risk. Venous thromboembolism is the other risk. Again, it's dose-dependent, it's route-dependent. A transient increase is seen with oral HRT, but not with transdermal. So I really think that the risks of HRT are, in fact, incredibly small. The bisphosphonates, they have a whole number of risks. The gastrointestinal side effects really have been reduced by less frequent dosing. But we've got all these other problems, atrial fibrillation, which is seen particularly with intravenous bisphosphonates, but not exclusively. Osteonecrosis of the jaw usually follows tooth extractions, but not always. Inflammatory eye disease with intravenous bisphosphonates, possibly esophageal cancer, has been suggested with oral bisphosphonates, but the data suggesting that came from the Million Women study, so that's probably wrong as well. Uh, and femoral stress fractures, which people are increasingly familiar with, with long-term bisphosphonates. So these drugs certainly are not completely safe. Tibolone is another alternative. Here the problem is that hip fracture prevention has not been demonstrated. That's purely a numbers game and length of treatment game. Breast cancer is a difficult one because one study showed it was reduced in normal women, but there was an increased risk in breast cancer survivors. So we really don't know where we are there. And there's an apparent increased risk of stroke. So tibolone certainly is no safer than HRT uh, and maybe less safe. Raloxifene, the, the CIRMs, are another treatment for osteoporosis. This, these are data from the Ruth study, which is a huge study, over 10,000 women. And the <coughs> bottom line is that there was a significant reduction in terms of uh, vertebral fractures, but absolutely no effect in reducing hip fractures and other non-vertebral fractures. So really, this is a very limited outcome. And there was an increased risk of venous thromboembolism. So clearly, this treatment is not a match for HRT. Strontium ranulate, the studies here were done in elderly osteoporotic women. Um, we don't know whether they'd be effective in prevention in younger women. But the problem here is that there is an increased risk of venous thromboembolism. And particularly now, there have been serious risk of cardiovascular disease, which has very much limited the use of strontium ranulate, certainly in Europe. Um, and so people really are not tending to use this treatment wherever possible. Calcium and vitamin D, I don't regard as a treatment on its own anyhow. Um, it has there's been demonstration of fracture protection, but this has only been seen in very elderly women who've been imprisoned in nursing homes uh, and not allowed to see the outside world. There is an increased risk of renal calculi. Whether there's an increased risk of cardiovascular disease with calcium supplementation is very controversial, and we haven't time to go into that now. So I want to just 
sort of go, go on to some new treatments, uh, and these are looking at signals, first of all, to the osteoclast. Uh, and parathyroid hormone is a major stimulator of osteoclast uh, activity. Um, oh, sorry. Um, the, the, and the rank ligand is another major driver of osteoclast activity. And so by blocking rank ligand, you would expect to reduce bone resorption. And so an antibody was developed uh, against rank ligand, denosumab, uh, and there are good data to show that this is a very effective treatment uh, in terms of fracture prevention, and it's a very simple treatment to give. But again, it has side effects, increased muscle pain, increased cholesterol levels, but probably the most important is there are increased infection rates with denosumab, and this has made it particularly difficult to, to give to patients, for example, who are on corticosteroids for things like asthma and chronic pulmonary disease, where the last thing you want is to increase their infection rate. The other thing to, to do with osteoclasts is to actually stop them from being able to resorb bone. And the way they do that is by uh, secreting tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase, but also the protease cathepsin K, uh, and antibodies have been developed to that to block cathepsin K. And adanacatib uh, was one of these, uh, these treatments uh, and went into full evaluation clinical trial, uh, and they found that it was effective in terms of reducing uh, fracture risk to some extent, um, and, and clearly also had a positive effect on bone density. But, surprisingly, they found that an increased risk of stroke, and that was particularly so worrying that production of this and further development has been completely stopped. And interestingly, they saw increased atrial fibrillation and some atypical fractures, which I think was quite surprising. If you look at the, the osteoblasts, is there something we can do here for treatment to increase bone formation? Uh, and one of the main drivers here would be parathyroid hormone. And, of course, that has been used as a treatment. Uh, it's effective, but there are risks. In the UK, the main risk of giving parathyroid hormone is bankruptcy because it's so expensive that we can't afford to use it. £5,000 for an 18-month course, so that's about €5,100, um, and probably $5,200. So it's an expensive treatment. There are no hip fracture data, so we don't know it for sure if it prevents hip fracture. It probably does. And there are other problems with it, hypersensitivity. These tend not to be a real problem, but the cost is certainly a major problem. And the route of administration is daily subcutaneous injections, so that is not a very convenient therapy. The other main driver for the uh, osteoblast regulation is the WINT-LRP a signaling pathway, and that stimulates uh, osteoblastic activity. And there are two natural inhibitors of that, DICOPTH1 and sclerostin. And so they have developed antibodies against these natural inhibitors to stop them from blocking the WINT pathway and therefore allowing them to, to stimulate osteoblast uh, activity. And so far, the sclerostin antibody is the one that has been uh, tested the most, uh, and there's been the clinical trial published on romosuzumab uh, showing that there's a significant decrease in fractures in a very short space of time. They said there was one case of osteonecrosis of the jaw, one case of atypical fracture, which I doubt were very much due to the treatment at all, were probably due to previous treatments in these patients. So this is a promising uh, new, uh, new treatment, but we don't know yet what will be the long-term safety aspects of this treatment. There are other therapies that people have tried, which I'm not going to go through, but all of these have been uh, published in, in small studies, uh, claimed that they're effective and they probably aren't. Things like boron sub, uh, supplementation. Boron is well-named because it, it is the most inert uh, active, uh, substance in the entire universe. So how on earth it could have anything to do with bone is beyond me. Then you've got these herbal medicines, Hashimodrumchin, which is a Chinese herbal medicine. Guinness is an Irish herbal medicine. Probably effective. It contains 65 milligrams of <coughs> calcium in every single pint. So if you, think, if you drink 12, 12 pints a day, that should protect your skeleton. It may increase your risk of falls. 
So to conclude, I think we have a number of treatment options available. Not all of them prevent hip fracture, and I think that's a, an important consideration. All treatments have got unwanted effects. There's no treatment that doesn't have unwanted effects. And some we have yet to discover, and I personally still have concerns about the very long-term effects of having bisphosphonate stuck in your skeleton for, for decades. And I think that HRT remains a treatment of choice for prevention of osteoporosis in women because there is nothing better, there is nothing safer, and there is nothing cheaper. There are many options for treatment of osteoporosis, but they've all got unwanted effects, and I think we really have to, ben to balance the risks of treatment against the risks of the disease. Thank you very much.